I can't remember a time when I didn't know the name Fidel Castro. I mean, I've known that name as long as I, since I've been alive, and it's something that has always been part of my life and my family's life. They fled Cuba, as you mentioned, as political exiles. And th there is this tendency when world leaders die to kind of misplace this romanticism around some world leaders, but Fidel Castro is someone who was a tyrant. He was a killer. He was a liar. And I really never realized how fortunate I was to be born in this country until I did a story that took me to the Florida Straits and I was embedded with the Coast Guard and they were intercepting Cuban rafters and, and Cuban go fast boats that were smuggling in uh, Cuban citizens and I got to see firsthand what it looked like on these boats dozens of families babies in diapers and the best choice that these families had was to put their children on a boat in the middle of the night not knowing what would happen mm. than to live in Cuba and Cuba at a distance may look beautiful it may look mysterious it may look nostalgic but up close it is cracked it is faded and the people are hungry and that should be the legacy of Fidel Castro that is uh, Tom Yamas of ABC News reacting on Saturday to the death of Fidel Castro which has polarized leaders here in the US and abroad president-elect Donald Trump's initial public reaction was a forward tweet Fidel Castro is dead exclamation point. Later, he issued a longer statement saying, in part, Fidel Castro's legacy is one of firing squads, theft, unimaginable suffering, poverty, and the denial of fundamental human rights. While Cuba remains a totalitarian island, it is my hope that today marks a move away from the horrors endured for too long and toward a future in which the wonderful Cuban people finally live in the freedom they so richly deserve. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi said in part, quote this, generations of Cuban political prisoners, democracy activists and families suffered under Fidel Castro's rule. In their name, we will continue to press the Cuban regime to embrace the political, social and economic dreams of the Cuban people. Compare that to President Obama Quote, we know that this moment fills Cubans with powerful emotions. History will record and judge the enormous impact of this singular figure on the people and the world around him. Sorry, what, what's he said? Today, we offer condolences to Fidel Castro's family. Power, powerful emotions. And our you mean thoughts like, and like Stalin? Prayers. Uh, Stalin uh, stirred powerful emotions? I guess it's sort of left inside open. Inside the kulaks? It's left open. Uh, it's not saying he was great. Uh, no, it's actually not saying anything. You have a guy that tortured people and would not allow them to be free. I'm not sure why you can't say it marks the end, squads. hopefully, of an era. But it doesn't. And that's something we need to talk about. What is going to change well, yeah, but, but, since but, his brother's... But, 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 but why is the president Pontius Pilate here and washing his hands of what? anything... Uh, it gets worse if you go north to Canada. Does. Let's do that really quickly uh, Canadian for Prime the boxer. Minister Justin uh, Trudeau's oh, office. Yeah. He is a boxer. Oh my God! Get him down. Oh my God! This, um, is, this is the most unspeakable. He issued a statement saying this. Say it this is, to the families who were tortured by Fidel Castro for 50 years. So imagine you're one of them, and you hear this. It is with deep sorrow that I learned today of the death of Cuba's longest serving president. Fidel Castro was a larger than life leader who served his people for almost half a century. What, Mike Barnacle, what? Well, I can, re I can remember covering the Mariel uh, Harbor uh, the evacuation in 1980. I was in Key West, Florida. We rented a boat, went out to meet the flotilla. It was a flotilla of many, many ships coming across uh, the bay. And to see, to see and hear and speak to people, there were a lot of like degenerates that they right, on right. those boats too. But to see and hear people who would risk their lives, their right. children's lives, to flee that island and why they wanted to flee that island would put a whole new he, twist on Prime Minister Trudeau's state. Absolutely, he was an absolute beast. And he there's also John Meacham. You remember back in the mid 1990s, uh, he sent his air force up to shoot down pilots in Cessnas. Uh, mm -hmm. And they celebrated that as a great military victory, uh, killing innocent people. Well, and also the president said history will record and judge. Well, I think the first thing history has to record and judge about Castro is that he was largely responsible for what Arthur Schlesinger called the most dangerous moment in human history, which was in October 1962, uh, when we came as close as we ever have to uh, thermonuclear war in large measure uh, because of Castro's attempt to uh, uh, 
take on the United States, to be a conduit for Khrushchev uh, to expand their reach uh, into the Western Hemisphere uh, in answer to, in some ways, the United States putting uh, missiles in, uh, in Turkey. And so I think that any conversation about this has to uh, include the fact that uh, Michael Dobbs, of the Washington, formerly the Washington Post, wrote a wonderful book about this in which he quotes a letter from Jackie Kennedy to Khrushchev after President Kennedy's assassination in which he said that the big men know how to restrain themselves. It's the little men that we have to worry about. And Castro was one of those little uh, men. Mark Albert, why would anyone want to romanticize why? Someone who brutalizes people. Or leave people. open. I mean, uh, I mean, it's it's for 50 years. Leave, it's a stunning leave thing. Open for that he was a, a dictator who brutalized and terrorized his people and kept them from having economic or human opportunity. I just don't understand the desire to romanticize them. It's sick. Joining us now, Congressman Carlos Corbello. His own parents fled Fidel Castro's tyranny in the 1960s. Also with us, former Republican Congressman Lincoln diaz Velarde of Florida. He was born in Havana and fled the island with his family after their home was looted and burned by pro-Castro forces during the revolution. He is the chairman of the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. So, Lincoln, I, let's start with you. We'll start with what, what, are you what are your thoughts? You obviously fought the repression uh, that you saw on the island uh, for some time uh, in, in Congress. What, what are your thoughts today? Well, uh, Joe, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I agree with John Meacham that uh, history will record that the only uh, leader, the only dictator, the only person in power who ever asked for a first, nu a first strike, a nuclear strike uh, on the United States of America uh, was Fidel Castro. His uh, declassified letter to Khrushchev during the missile crisis saying, if the invasion comes, it is necessary, Mr. Chairman, for the Soviet Union to launch a nuclear first strike. Uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, on the United States. In other words, if, you come, if the United States comes and gets me to liberate the Cuban people, please uh, eliminate the United States from the face of the earth. That was Fidel Castro, a yeah. pathological liar, murderer, and uh, uh, someone who uh, had no limits in yeah. his egotism. So and what do I feel? It's just like when I saw, and, and, and you know, obviously, uh, I, I also read history uh, and lived, uh, for example, in Franco's Spain. When Franco died, when Trujillo uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, killed, uh, it's not that freedom and democracy came immediately to those countries, but those were necessary steps. Right. And within a few years, there were democratic transitions because okay. the international community insisted right. on a democratic Con transition for those right. countries. Congressman Curbelo, uh, obviously in the past four years, the president has been working to reestablish diplomatic relations with Cuba. There's been big changes. Is there any way to perhaps make an argument for the president's statement? Any strategic reason why he would have left his word so open? <clears throat> for interpretation? Look, it's just a reflection of uh, the way he views the world. It's a very lukewarm approach. It's why so many people in this country are frustrated and uh, voted for a change candidate in this last election mm -hmm. because they see and listen to politicians like the president in this case who are unwilling to state a simple truth that Fidel Castro was a dictator, a murderer, an enemy of the United States. My own family uh, felt this. My grandfather was imprisoned for 12 years and tortured uh, for opposing the government. His brother was uh, executed without trial. I mean, this was the nature of Fidel Castro. This is who he was. Your uncle, and I well, think I'm sorry, the most why, important... Why, why was your uncle executed by Fidel Castro? For, for opposing the government and uh, no trial. Uh, he was uh, just executed with uh, uh, dozens of others. So how do you feel uh, so, when the Canadian Prime Minister uh, praises yeah. this man as a great leader who served his people well for 50 years? It's very painful. It's very painful and it's very sad and that's why I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure the truth gets out because that's what uh, Fidel Castro and his government uh, have also been very good at throughout the years at propaganda, at selling a lie about who he is, about who he was in this case, about what the Cuban Revolution was. The Cuban Revolution was about death, about theft, about opposing American interests all over the world and it remains that way today. 
except that the, the intellectual author, the inspiration of uh, that revolution, of all that death and destruction, uh, is no longer on the face of the earth, and that certainly brings relief uh, to many of our families, right. and uh, that's why you see so much uh, celebration in Miami. It's not so much that someone died, but that this uh, psychological, this heavy psychological burden, this cloud, has finally been right. lifted. So, Jeffrey Goldberg, let's talk about what happens next. Where uh, uh, Lincoln talked about the possibility of uh, reforms coming, but reforms coming perhaps more slowly. What do you see uh, happening in Cuba now with the passing of Castro? Is it a largely symbolic passing, or do you expect in the next few years for Cuba to turn the page and pass real democratic reforms? Well, well, let's see what happens when Raul, Raul Castro leaves the scene. His brother, who is now the dictator in charge, uh, you know, there's, a, there's speculation that now that Fidel is gone, Raul will feel less burdened by the past and will open up to more market reforms, for instance. But you know, I was just I was down there not long ago. Um, it's not it's not entirely clear that much of anything has changed yet since the. American opening. Uh, obviously, American businesses are more interested in going into Cuba than Cuba is interested in having them. Um, so I think we're going to have to wait uh, mm -hmm. and watch and see um, and, and see uh, what happens after Raul passes the scene. But the reforms that everybody's hoping for, they just haven't come yet. Yep. Jeffrey Goldberg, thank you very much. Congressman Carlos Curbelo and former Congressman Lincoln Diaz Ballard, thank you both as well. Still ahead, Trump transition advisor Kellyanne Conway says the president and president elect have been speaking regularly since the election, including a 45 minute conversation on Saturday. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.